Hey y'all, let me tell you about Gobble. All Gobble Meal Kits are pre-prepped. That means less work for you and less waste in your kitchen. Their meal kits include everything you need so you can save time at the store or just skip that trip entirely. I got the box in and I had three different meals. I had a Kung Pao chicken, crispy fish tacos, and a beef boom jignon. However you say it, but let me tell you about the classic beef boom jignon. Look, it came with beef pot roast and a beef broth concentrate, red wine demi glaze, cremini mushrooms, siapelloni onions, mashed potatoes, baby carrots, and rosemary thyme butter. It was so easy to make. Literally like 15 minutes it took Cindy. And let me tell you something, all the dishes were fire. But this thing was like a taste explosion in my mouth. It's just un real. We've got to spend more time together and more time doing the things we love because everything came in this one single box right to my door. So see what a difference Gobble will make for your household. Right now, they're offering my listeners a fantastic limited time deal. You get $120 off across four boxes plus free shipping and free cookies. And let me tell you, those cookies, I ate one that was sin baked and it was delicious. Go to gobble.com slash real life. That's G-O-B-B-L-E dot com forward slash real life for $120 off your first four boxes. This offer is not available on the home site, so don't miss out. This is genius. It's taste explosions in your mouth like you've never had. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. If you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. Choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. Sponsored by Chumba Casino. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. Real Life Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you weekly by Woody Overton, Jim Rathman, and executive producer Toby Tomplay. Yeah, the right to remain silent. contain descriptions of acts of violence or that are of a sexual nature it should be for people that are 18 years or older heed my warning people Jim and I do not get the facts of these cases off of the internet or from some television show the facts we're retelling you were presented to us by the victims of the crimes or the perpetrators who committed the crimes against the victims my description of the crime scenes or what I saw with my own two eyes. If you're going to get offended, please turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. And Jim Raffman is down in Florida doing what he does, but I'm coming to you from the road today um, on something that's not related to Real Life, Real Crime but so the audio, y'all, I'll be getting it out to executive producer Toby Tom play and you should, hopefully you'll get this Saturday afternoon. I'm recording from a hotel room. Um, I'm actually doing the first live video recording ever of a real life, real crime podcast. And I'm on the road working, uh, 
for another one of my companies and I just happened to have a professional um, videographer production company that's with me and that's Rodriguez Productions. It's Austin Rodriguez out of Houston, Texas. And he, out of the kindness of his heart, is, is set up all his lights and, and doing this. And uh, so we're going to have fun with it. And it's released to Patreon members only. So Patreon members, you will be seeing the first ever live before and after uh, in the whole length of the episode. All right, that being said, today's case, I told y'all, um, first of all, let me back up again. Hope everybody's staying safe. Y'all stay well. And I've been on the road the last couple of weeks and, and, you know, it's challenging it's social distancing and all that, but, um, hopefully businesses start opening back up and, and people can start making a living again, but y'all stay safe and my prayers are for you. All right. So I told y'all the last episode I did, um, was I shot that man. Now, I told you at the end of that episode, I bet you a million dollars that you couldn't figure out how it was going to tie into this episode. Now, this episode may have to be two parts because it's a crazy-ass story, and it's got a lot of twists and turns to it. But you still will not be able to figure out how it ties into I Shot This Man. Now, if it goes into two parts, I don't know because um, I'm just going to roll with it and see how long it plays out. But... I guarantee you won't be able to figure it out, but it ties in. I shot this man and it's significant. Okay. So the name of the episode will be false positive, false positive. That's what I'm going to go with. It just popped in my mind. All right. So December, I think it was 2006. I was working as a detective with Livingston Parish Sheriff's office and, um, I think it was December 27th. Yeah, I was on, on the 27th. I got a, a call from another detective. It was late in the evening. I think they might have paged me out for it. They called and said, hey, man, we need your help on a polygraph. And I said, okay, what's up? And, and they said that they had um, a female that they needed tested, and they explained when I got, got to my office. So I drove in. And I had a little separate office downstairs away from the uh, – the tech where the tech's office was at that time. And, but that office used to be when Stan Carpenter was chief of narcotics, that was the narcotics office. So it was down this little stairwell, halfway down the stairwell, tucked in the side. It, it, it used to be the entrance to the old jail in the Livingston Parish courthouse. So anyway, I, I go to my office and then um, I meet with some detectives and some federal agents and they, they come in and they tell me that, they had a bank robbery that morning. I mean, you know what? I'm not going to say the victim's name. I'm not going to say the name of the bank. And I'm not even going to say the name of the town. And I'm not going to say the victim's name because she doesn't need to be traumatized again. But I guess y'all figure it out later on. So it doesn't matter. But anyway, they, they told me there was a bank robbery that morning that three subjects had entered the bank before it opened with keys and a passcode to rob the bank. Now they got the keys and the passcode and this passcode for the vault. Now, listen, I'm not a technical bank guy, right? I've worked a couple of bank robberies in my career, but when it comes down to it, usually back, especially back then the feds worked it, but the agents told me that they did not believe what it was that they had a teller who worked at the bank who said she was kidnapped the night before that at her house and that these people held her overnight and, uh, and threatened to hurt her family and everything. And she resisted her, tried to get away, et cetera. And uh, they took her to the bank that morning and they went in, they, you, uh, the bad guys went in, they left her in the car and she's duct taped and blindfolded, et cetera. And that they got away with an undisclosed amount of money, but then they threw her out, um, uh, at some park nearby and she was able to find a phone to call 911. So she calls 911. She tells them the story. Well, they, they go into the bank and the process, of course they have video and these guys made entry into the vault, right? So bear with me on this. Cause they, I, I'm technically it's probably not correct, but it's, it's how I remember in my head from what they told me, they said 
the Fed said that there's no way that they, being the bad guys, could have got into the vault of the bank if, unless the teller, the alleged victim, uh, had not pressed some extended time lock on the vault when she closed it the night before. Okay, so I asked them about that, and they said there's a certain thing that she has to do, and uh, if she does that, the vault will not, even doesn't matter who has the codes or keys or whatever the hell they use for vaults, the vault will not open, all right? And they said uh, that the bad guys were able, they believe, the feds believe the bad guys were able to make access into the vault because this teller had, or manager, whatever she was, had intentionally not pressed this extended lock. And I don't know what they call it, y'all, but the, uh, the extended thing. And that's the only way. So they were suspect that she was lying. They thought that she, she was part of it because um, otherwise it, it didn't matter if they had her keys and passcodes or whatever the hell they used. They couldn't have got in had she not pressed this button. So they thought she was lying. They thought she was she was a participant to the level that um, she didn't press the button intentionally, and that she probably planned it out with them, and they kicked her out of it, and she was going to get a cut back or whatever. I said, "Oh, so basically, you want me to polygraph her about her involvement in this bank robbery?" And they said, "Yeah." So they bring her in. I meet her. She's a nice young lady. And the first thing I notice about her, she's probably. I guess late twenties. Um, uh, she looked like hell. I mean, not that she wasn't ugly, but she just looked like she had red eyes. Now, remember, this is in the evening on the twenty seventh. Okay, she had red eyes. Uh, um, she'd been crying. Uh, you could tell her face was swollen. And so I bring her in, and and I separate myself from them. They've been questioning her all day and dealing with her, et cetera. So the first thing you want to do in the polygraph process is. Like I told y'all before, establish that relationship. And so what I do, I bring her in separate from them, shut the door and and sit her down and introduce myself. Hey, I'm Woody Overton. I understand you've been through a traumatic experience. And she said, but they don't believe me. And, and I said, it's, it's okay. I said, I said, I, I believe you. And I said, but we got to get into the details of the whole thing, sweetie. I said, I'm going to walk you through it. But I want you to understand, I don't work for the feds. And I, I don't care what they say, uh, but on this test today, I need you to be 100% honest with me. This is not grade school where you get a gold star for 99%. Today, I'm going to get you through this process. But when I ask you the questions, I need you to be 100% honest with me. And I'm going to believe you, everything you say. And, and less when we get done with the test and I score it, you have a problem with one or more of the questions. And I said, and then we'll talk about it and we can work it out. And so it took me a while. I'm paraphrasing, right? And, uh, this is over a period of time. And I got her some water. And then we go through the legal forms, the actually Miranda right forms and a consent to question form. But then you have polygraph rights. So she had to um, voluntarily consent to the polygraph. It's, it's a whole shitload of paperwork you have to go through. And meanwhile, the whole time we're going through it, I mean, I'm really establishing my connection with her, using my people skills, right? And and I'm real gentle with her and and uh, and everything. And then we get into the medical questions for me to determine whether or not she's mentally and physically fit to take the test, et cetera. And one of the medical questions is, when was the last time you slept? And, or, or how much sleep did you get last night? She says, shit, I hadn't slept in two days. And that threw a pause for me as an examiner because, I mean, tiredness can have an effect on the outcome of the test. It really can. And uh, I said, okay, I understand um, you haven't slept in two days. I said, but do you think you get through another hour and a half to three hours? She said, I've been getting through it this long that I just want this shit over with. I'm telling the truth. And, um, she said, I want to take this polygraph. I want, I want you to prove me innocent so we can move on, you know? And, and I said, okay, all right. And so I probably against my better judgment, I, I mean, I did want to stop it at this point when I already had the connection established with her, et cetera, and send her home for a night's sleep. The feds would have been pissed. My bosses would have been pissed and everything. And I'm like, 
I think she can get there, right? She's kind of, she's not nodding off and uh, um, while I'm talking to her or anything like that. And so we get through the medical stuff. I clear on the medical stuff, and then we get into what happened. I said, okay, now listen, I know you told your story, and I know you told it to the feds, and, and I know you told it to all the local cops, et cetera. I said, and I know you probably don't want to talk about it again. I know it's traumatic for you. I said, but you have to act like I don't know anything and tell me everything that happened from beginning to end. And I said that, you know, it's really beneficial for you because all these other people have been questioning you. They were the, the, you gave your statement in the beginning and they come back and they say whatever. And then, you know, when you focus on being on the defensive with them, when they're coming back at you with the questions, you might have missed out on some thoughts and th- things that you could remember as a witness to the crime. Meaning that if, you know, like an old Cajun man told me one time, he said, you want to stop somebody from messing with you, you grab a hand of fire ants and you throw it on them, and they're too busy dusting the fire ants off themselves to be but worried about you. I said, so all this time that you've been getting questioned by the feds, et cetera, you really hadn't been thinking about what part, what happened during the crime. You've been thinking about defending yourself. And she said, you're right. And, and I said, so look, Let's just take the time. And I said, I'm going to interrupt you and ask a lot of questions, but I need you to start from the beginning and we'll get through it. And this is what she said. She said on December 26th, the night before she had got off, uh, she closed the bank and I'm not going to say the town yet. We'll figure that out as we go. She closed the bank and she drove home and she lived on highway 43 in Albany, Louisiana. Now highway 43 is the easternmost highway that runs north and south in Livingston Parish. It's, it's Albany is, is right there. Uh, highway 190 that runs east to west actually crosses in Tangipo Parish, right? And she worked a couple towns over. No big deal. But so she lived on uh, she said she drove home from the bank and when she pulled into her driveway she drove a 1999 Toyota Camry I think. Um, she pulled into her driveway. She lived by herself she gets out of her car and she goes to gets to her door and she unlocking the door and when she, as she's unlocking the door, some people bum rushed her from behind and literally put a gun on her, grabbed her from behind, grabbed her around the neck, shoved her into her house and, and, and telling her, you know, bitch, we, don't you move, we're going to kill you, uh, et cetera. And they immediately started duct taping her up. Uh, they uh, put and they duct tape her hands. They um, uh, put some type of mask over and uh, over her face and, and stuff, and they and told her that they were going to use her. They were going to keep her overnight, and they were going to use her to rob the bank in the morning. They were going to use her passcodes and her uh, her keys and whatever y'all whatever it was. So. And so they took her, she said they took her, they drug her out of the house. She said she's scared to death. She almost wet herself. And they, they're telling you, you do anything, you try to escape, you try to uh, run, call for help, anything like that, we're going to kill your family members. We know where they live. We know who you are, we know where they live. And she said that they put her in a car with three people in Two of them were males, and, and she later, she thought all three of them were males at first, but two of them were males, and one of them ended up being a female. And um, But they weren't talking. Uh, the, the the female wasn't talking, and, and I'll explain that later on. But also, they took the keys to her car and stole her car also, so they meant there was a fourth. Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. Busy holiday season is here, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Gifts to spark joy, wonder, delight, and that's exactly what I want it feeling. Hey, y'all, I ordered 
a super cool piece. It's a candle with a sculpture of an LSU Tiger Stadium on top of it. And each officially licensed laser cut wooden replica features up to four layers of detail, creating a bird's eye view of a specific football field, seating section, and more. And every label includes your stadium's name, the team's logo, and school location. And it has a coconut soy vegan wax infused with sandalwood smell that creates tailgates and touchdown scent profile, reminiscent of game day. It's invigorating like fresh cut grass and nostalgic like smoke from a pre-game grill. And common like the crisp autumn air of a new semester on campus. Y'all, I love it. I have it at the base of my TV and I'm ready to watch the Tigers play on Saturday night, right? Uncommon Goods. Look, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. And many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S., They have the most meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. From holiday hosts and hostess gifts to the coolest finds for kids, to hits for everyone from the book lovers to diehard sports fans, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone, not the same old selection you can just find anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. So to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C. That's uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limit time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hey, ladies, are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? Well, you're definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living in our environment right now. It's in your food, your water, the air you breathe, the clothes you wear, your skincare products. They all mess with your hormones. Then there's the natural hormone changes your body goes through. Premium menopause, menopause. And while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean you have to suffer through it. The good news is you don't have to suffer through it anymore because now you have hormone harmony, a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. Hormone harmony is not just a hormone support and supplement. It's become a phenomenon. Women can't stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of hormone harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And the biggest benefit? Well, my wife says it makes her feel like her own self again. And that's what women mention over and over in the reviews. And there are over 30,000 reviews for hormone harmony. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use code RLRC at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use code RLRC for 15% off today. That's H-A-P-P-Y-M-A-M-M-O-T-H dot com and use code R-L-R-C. Person involved. And she said they drove for a ways. She couldn't see because she was blindfolded, etc. And then they went down some gravel road. I mean, she could hear the gravel crunching under the tires of the car. And then they parked and they got out. She heard some dogs barking, but she knew it was in the country. And she couldn't see any street lights through whatever the pillowcase or whatever they had on her head. And they brought her in this house and sat her down on the couch. Now, this is like 8.30 p.m. on the 26th. And they told her. And they, uh, one of them was talking to her, and, and the female didn't talk at this point. You know, they said, again, we're going to kill you. Uh, if you do anything, all you have to do is comply. And you were going to the bank in your car in the morning, and we're going to use your, we're going to use your keys and your passcodes, et cetera, to enter the safe. And she said that's what happened. She said she spent the most terrifying night of her life locked up there. She said they didn't mistreat her. They didn't beat on her. I asked her, you know, I said, uh, did they sexually assault you or violate you in any any way? And she's like, no, 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 no. And she said, um, she said, I just remember something. That's what she said. I did go to the bathroom at one point in the middle of the night. She said, we're up all night. They kept me up. And she said, I have to go to the bathroom. And uh, she said one of them took me to the bathroom and that was still taped and uh, and still had the thing on my head 
she said, but that's when I first time I realized it was a female involved because the girl was undoing her pants and pulling them down for her to sit on the toilet. And the girl said something about her pants. I don't remember what it was. And she said, then it clicks in her head. My God, there's a female in this too. She thought it was only guys at this point. So she said, yeah, I mean, she said they didn't do anything like that. Woody, she said, they, you know, just kept me there and, and, uh, they didn't do a lot of talking, et cetera. Um, and she said the next morning we went, well, she said, I assumed it was morning. She said, but they loaded me up after what seemed like an attorney actually had been all night. They loaded me up in my car. And she said, I know my, and what the inside of my car feels like. And we drove and drove and drove. She said, so I know we were, we were farther away than Albany from the bank. She said, I need, because I know how long it takes for me to get to work every day, right? She said, and we get to the bank, and I didn't have to go inside. She said, they had asked me, uh, one of the males had asked me about my keys and the code, and I told them. And she said, and they went in and got whatever they got, and then they they pushed me out uh, at that park. And she said, I was able to get the, the cover off my head, and I found somebody that had a cell phone, and I called 911. Okay, so then I started digging into the facts of the case, right? And I was correct. She started remembering things when I wasn't challenging her. She started remembering things about what had happened. And so I go, I go back and I walk her through the first step. I said, hey, and they come up behind you and you're going in your house, et cetera, et cetera. She started remembering things and because I'm taking her back. I'm walking her through it step by step. Um, I'm talking about, you know, the, the duct taping and, and what does she see before the duct taping? And I said, you know, I know it happened so fast, sweetie, but, you know, think about it now. Just take your time. You're not under any threat. Nobody can harm you. You're safe now. You're with me. Tell them, you know, just try to really picture it in your mind. And she said, holy shit. And I said, what? She said, I know. Oh, they had... Uh, supposedly had mask on that uh that's what she had said they they were masked up she said but you know what, what she said one of them had a mask on but like big eye holes she said i know who it is woody i know who it is and i'm like okay shit here we go and it's just about to get real i said i said who is it and she said his name and i'm not gonna say it yet because this is obviously gonna run into a two-part episode um she told me who it was. And I said, well, how do you know him? She said, I went to high school with him. I graduated with him. I went to school with him. I've known him my whole life. She said, I don't know why I didn't remember before. She said, and I said, are you sure? She said, I am positive. And she said, I, I heard his voice at one point too. She said, I guess I was so scared that I didn't focus in on it. And I was like, okay. So she gave me uh, the guy's name and she said, I swear to you, I said, okay, would you be able to pick them out of a photo lineup or what we call a six pack, y'all? And she said, yes. And so I stopped the, the polygraph process then and I went out to the uh, the powers that be, the feds and whomever. And I said, listen, she said she just remembered who one of the suspects is and is able to identify him from his facial features of, of in the short time she saw. And they were like, oh, she didn't tell us that. I said, I'm telling you. What she told me, and, the, and his name is this, and she grew up with him and went to high school with him, graduated with him, and she can pick him out of a six-pack. So they are like, well, you know, keep proceeding with the polygraph. We need to know because we still think she might have involvement. So I'm going to do that anyway, And but you need to go get a six-pack, right? And, and so, y'all, the six-pack, um, the Louisiana State Police – that when, when they make the six packs, they're so good. They take a computer program and they run uh, the. You get it, first of all, you run this person's criminal history, and and you get their mugshot or or their driver's license photo, whatever it is that's on file. Then that Louisiana State Police computer scans through a, a million or however many photos they have, a driver's license photos or uh, photos with the same background, et cetera the people of the same race, uh, and they look, you know, I'm telling you, I've seen some where I knew who the bad guy was and I couldn't pick them out. That's how good these, these photos are that, that resemble 
these people. So it's not like in the old days when we used to, you know, you could put some in that didn't have any anything to look at. Uh, but it's not like when they brought them in for a live lineup and one guy's six foot six and one guy's five foot nine and one guy, you know, has blonde hair and one has brown, whatever. This, this is legit. So they go to do that. I go back for the polygraph. Now I go in and we'll go through her whole story again. And she was able to remember some more details and she kept coming back to her classmates. She said, God, I can't believe he would do that to me and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. I said, but I, I told her, I said, look, I'm very glad that you remember that detail, but we still need to get this polygraph out of the way. I said, when I give you them, my stamp of approval that you didn't do this bank robbery, then it'll be over for you and you'll be treated like the victim that you should be treated. She said, but they've been treating me like a suspect the whole day. I said, I know, sweetie, but I'm going to get you through it. So to sum it up on it, the questions, the relevant questions I asked, it was real simple. It was three questions. I asked, did you plan with anyone to rob the bank, right? If what the feds were saying is true, then she would have had to scheme this, right, and get these other people. There were definitely three people that went into the bank that wasn't her, that used her, her codes and stuff, right? So she, well, I know she didn't go in the bank and actually rob it. And she, her answer was absolutely emphatically no. And I said, did you plan uh, with those those people, those people being the bad guys, that, did you plan with those people to rob the bank this morning? So, and uh, just a continuation of question one. And she says, no, emphatically, right? But then the catch-all question I, I, I want, want to ask her is, did you participate in any way in the robbing of that bank? And that bank is clearly defined as the bank. I just told her, I said, I don't care if you've been robbing banks the rest of your entire life. I'm only talking about the bank that you work with, that the three subjects are seen going in on camera uh, on the morning of December 27th. She said, no. I said, okay, well, then we got to talk about that. I said, because the feds are telling me that the only way they could gain access to the vault is because you, when you shut the vault last night, didn't press some extended time lock thing. She said, oh, no. She said, I pressed it. Uh, I pressed it. I, I know I did. And um, I'm like, are you sure? And she said, yeah. And I, and this was probably a screw up on my part, y'all. The and I just really that really that that could have been the only relevant question on the test. Um, but so I just want to really make clear. I said, listen again. I'm telling you, they said they have some way of checking, uh, and in that they couldn't have got into the vault had you pressed the extended time lock. She said, Woody, I'm telling you. She said. I mean, she said, I may be crazy, she said, but I'm telling you, I pressed, I pressed that lock or whatever it was. I, I did that switch thing. And, and I said, so when participation, my question is, did you participate in any way in the robbing the bank? I said, I'm not talking about you being the victim of kidnapping, et cetera. I'm talking about you plan with these people to do it. You gave them the keys to do it. Um, you did not press whatever that switch is that so they couldn't open the vault after business hours or whatever. And, and then you didn't get any money off of it or anything like that. She said, no, I did not. So we go to run the test and I do a little practice test ahead of time where I have them, I attach them to the instrument and I have them lie to me on one out of eight questions. And I don't know the answer to the question. Um, and at the end of that test, I tell them what it is that they lied about. And it's a little, bitty small eye that she's not going to get in trouble about, but I got her question right. And when I do that, she's like, her eyes go big. She's like, Oh snap. I'm like, right. If, if I can catch you on a little bitty lie, what's it going to look like to you on my charts? If you lie to me about something that's important to you, but like the, participating in this bank robbery by not pressing that extended lock, it's going to be, your action is going to be much stronger. So, then we get straight into the main test, which under Louisiana law for it to be valid, we have to do it at least two separate times, but usually you do it three or four, just depending uh, um, on how it goes. She's attached to an instrument. It's right after the practice test. We get into it. 
So the first question is something like, are you now in the state of Louisiana? Yes. Second question, regarding um, the bank robbery, do you intend to answer all questions truthfully? Yes. The third question is a, is a control. It doesn't matter. The, um, the next one is the question, did you plan to rob that bank? No. Did you plan to rob that bank uh, this morning? No. Did you participate in any way in the robbing of that bank? Remember, I hounded her because the feds hounded me on the one particular question they wanted with, about the lock. She said no. Immediately, I knew she she was showing deception indicated on that one question. Okay, but I, I tell them. But before the test starts, I said, "Look, you know, you have to sit still, don't move. The, 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 there's 25 seconds between each question. I'll ask the question, you, you'll respond. Then it'll be 25 seconds to the next question. The test itself, y'all, is very short. It only takes a couple minutes, right?" And so we get to the first chart, we get done. But I tell them, I said, don't look at me, don't pay attention to me. I'm not scoring this as going along or anything like that. All I'm doing is uh, simply keeping things straight and making sure you're not trying to cheat me or beat me, et cetera. So when, when it's, the test is over, I say the test is now complete. Uh, please remain still for 10 seconds. And then I turn off that first chart and... Then I tell her, say, hey, you can move around or whatever if you need to for a minute. I'm going to let your arm rest because it has a blood pressure cuff on it. Um, I said, but don't ask me anything. I said, and, and uh, again, I'm not scoring as it goes along. And I, I do that mainly, y'all, so they're not sitting there watching me. If I have to, if I make a facial motion or something, then I they don't get freaked out thinking I think that they're guilty or, or whatever. So we get through the first chart, go give her a little break, get into the second one, ask the same questions. And again, on the participation question, she had a problem with it. I don't tell her anything yet, right? So stop, take the break, do it again. I think, I think I did it like four times. And every single time she had a problem on the participation question. Now, we got done. I untached the instrument from her and everything. And I always tell them I don't score it as it's going along, but I've done so many tests that I can do the math in my head as it goes along. And what bothered me about it was she passed flying colors about planning to rob the bank and planning to rob the bank that morning, right? But she had an issue with their participation. And, the, and so the, Post-test interview is what they call it, basically an interrogation. I told her, I said, look, sweetie, I believe everything you're saying. I said, but we got an issue. And she's like, what, what? And what is it, Woody? And I said, when I asked you this question, the participation question, I said, your, your body showed deception indicated. Your physiological responses to the question were negative. And she said, she's like, I don't know why, I don't know why. And I said, well, let's talk about it, you know? And then um, she said, I don't why are we even talking about it? I'm telling you who it is that kidnapped me. And she said, they can go get him. I said, we're working on that. But the, the, I need to be able to go out there and explain to these guys why you had a problem with participation question. And she was adamant. And then I said, but, but did you not press the lock, sweetie? She said, I'm telling you. I, if I didn't press it, she said, it would be the first time ever she said, I don't even know what they're telling you about. She said, because the time frame would have been passed on that. She said, I was thinking about that when you were asking me the question. The time frame would have been passed on that where it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Uh, she said, so I don't know either where these federal agents are getting their information from. She said, I was thinking about that. And she said, but obviously they couldn't have gotten in the vault. And, and I understand that it looks bad on me if they're saying that it happened before the time frame. And then I started thinking, I mean, this girl looks like hell. I mean, she's been up, let's see, she worked the whole day before. She gets up at like 6 o'clock in the morning. So she worked all the day of the 26th. She gets kidnapped at gunpoint, held hostage, duct taped up all night long uh, into the early morning hours of 27th. Then she reports frantically her, the, the crime that's been committed against her. And at first... At, 
didn't take them long to start looking at her as a suspect, so they hounded her ass all day long. So she's been over, what, 24, 48 hours, probably by the time she gets to me, and I started thinking, damn it, I shouldn't have run her. Now, that, that could have been one of the problems, right? She's tired. But then I really started thinking about the Fed swearing up and down she didn't press this damn lock. So I just told her, I said, you know what? Chill out. And Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Mochi. Mochi is a telehealth platform that connects patients seeking medication-based weight loss treatment with board-certified doctors and dietitians to help them determine the best treatment options to accomplish that goal. Mochi's program is completely virtual, meaning you can access their services anywhere in the United States and you will be meeting with their team online. You deserve doctors that listen. Mochi is dedicated to providing holistic, patient-centered care that prioritizes overall well-being with the goal of transforming how weight management is approached. Mochi Health takes a holistic approach to weight loss that includes visit with board-certified doctors, nutrition consultations, and medications delivered to your door. Science-backed medications include GLP-1s like Ozempic and generic compound versions, affordable and accessible, regardless of insurance covers. With Mochi, their dietitians work hand-in-hand with your medication to create personalized nutrition plans that fit your lifestyle. Reach your weight loss goals with science-backed, FDA-approved, GLP-1 medications and support from real doctors and guidance from registered dietitians and help with making easy and sustainable changes to achieve results. Y'all have seen this. My wife has done it. My brother-in-law has done it. One of my best friends is doing it. And it really is an amazing process that works. So get started at joinmochi.com and use code RLRC to receive $40 off. That's join, J-O-I-N-M-O-C-H-I.com and use code RLRC to receive $40 off and let Mochi help change your life. Hey, y'all, you want to set your child up for success? Is your child struggling with a specific subject or need help with the subject? Is your child ahead? Not getting challenged enough in class? Well, IXL Learning is an online learning program that enriches your homeschool curriculum. It offers practice in math, English, language arts, science, and social studies while adapting to each child, meeting them where they are. Plus, IXL encourages students to become curious and empowers them to choose how to learn. Look, we homeschool our son. No doubt about it. He's more of a visual learner, and we use IXL, and Cindy teaches him, and there are so many different benefits to the program. It adapts to exactly what he needs in different areas. So IXL is the perfect supplement to your homeschool curriculum. IXL offers interactive practice problems, educational games, lessons, and video tutorials for every topic you're teaching at home. It's easy to use, time-saving. Everything on IXL is organized by grade, subject, topic, and subtopic, making it simple to find activities for the exact skills you're covering. IXL offers instant feedback and explanations of new topics as kids use the program. Kids can explore any topic in any grade level. They aren't forced into a single learning path like they are on other programs. If you're homeschooling your child because they were falling behind or... Because they were too far ahead like our son, IXL is a great program to help them get the exact support they need. Kids love IXL's positive feedback awards and educational games. IXL is trusted by 15 million students worldwide and has proven to improve performance in over 75 scientific research studies. Make an impact on your child's learning. Get IXL now. And Real Life Real Crime listeners can get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when they sign up today at IXL.com slash today. Visit IXL.com slash today to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price. And don't forget, Real Life Real Crime listeners get 20% off. Y'all, we really do use this product, and it's been a godsend. And... um. 
and I got her another water and I said, just sit tight. I'm going to go see where we're at on, on the investigation of, of the guy that you ID. And so I go out and I think that, and then look, I work for the feds a lot and, and I, I love them all. And, uh, but uh, there's always a little bit of a pissing contest between the feds and the local authorities and the state authorities. I mean, it just, it's just uh, maybe too many alpha males or whatever, but uh, go out there and uh, with these guys to listen, she had an issue on the participation question. And that was question was fine mainly. Um, and I hounded on it. And I shouldn't have uh, by y'all telling me that she didn't press this extended time lock. And, and the agent was all cocky with himself. He's like, yeah, well, she didn't do it. She didn't do it. I said, show me that she didn't do it. And, she, and he said, what do you mean? I said, show me that she didn't do it. And I said, I don't believe that. I mean, she passed the question on not planning to rob the bank. And she, she and, and planning to rob the bank that morning. How in the hell could she pass that if she intentionally didn't press the, the time lock, right? I said, show it to me. And he was like, oh, I don't know. Show you. And I said, you know what? I said, and matter of fact, she's telling me the time lock thing wouldn't even come into play because it was after uh, the time where it would have been released. And he was like, what do you mean? I said, I'm telling you what she told me. So um, you got me hounding her on this one question that, and she's showing deception indicated on it. And meanwhile, during the polygraph process, she comes up with the guy or one of the suspects that kidnapped her and, and, and held her overnight and, and did the bank robbery, you know, and, and she says she can ID him out of the six pack. And I, I, I said, do you, are you sure you have your facts straight? Well, they'd like to be a little cocky. And I, I think they, they, you know, I, I called them out. I, I called them out. I don't give a shit who you are. I, I don't want to put, do the wrong thing with an innocent person, which is why the story it's going to continue to get crazier and crazier. So they went to confer uh, or call somebody or whatever. Meanwhile, the, um, uh, the other detectives in the sheriff's office had come up with a, a six pack of the guy. And I said, listen, y'all been questioning her. Y'all been hounding her. Let me go down and show the six pack. But because, you know, you don't want to upset her emotionally. She's, you know, rightfully so, pretty pissed off. I said, I, I don't think she had anything to do with it. I don't know about this time lock thing, the participation part. I said, but let me go down and show the photo lineup and see what we can get. That way there's no, you know, we don't get her. I said, first, and the, secondly, I shouldn't have tested her because she's been up for 48 hours, you know. Um, but, so let me do it. They agree. So I go down and shut the door and I sit down with her. I said, now listen, I'm going to show you what we call a six pack or photo lineup. It's going to have six individuals in it, including uh, their pictures in it, including the one that you said that you positively ID from his facial features and his voice and whatever, as the guy that you grew up with, the guy that you went to high school with that, you know, but, and you know, I asked her about this guy. It, Y'all, I'm going to digress for a second. I had asked her about it, and when when she told me, she said, I just don't know why he would do it. She, he was such a nice guy, and he, he's not a gangbanger or anything, and and he's, I just don't know why he would do it, would he? But I swear, I swear to God it was him. I swear to God. And the, so back to the six-pack. And I said, six individuals, and one of which is going to be the name that you gave me. I said, the rest of them are going to look almost identical to him. I said, so when I do, when I show you this photo lineup, I want you to only point to the person if you can 100% positively ID him. I don't want you guessing. I don't want you making assumptions. I said, sweetie, this is very, very important. I said, when you, if you pick this guy out positively as being, being the guy that was in your house last night, duct taping you, kidnapping you and all that. I mean, this is the, the bank robbery alone could get him 99 years. The, the kidnapping is life. And I said, so don't guess. I said, I need you to be able to say it with such a degree of certainty that you can get on this, a witness stand and testify in his trial 
that he was there and he did it. She said, I'm telling you, he did it. I said, okay. So I lay out the, the six pack y'all and the six pack is if you take a, like a, um, a, a yellow legal, um, manila fold or whatever they call them. And they, it has six squares cut in it. And the, what they do is they, the computerized printout of the photos come out in this six and they're evenly spaced apart. And you put this, this folder over it where when you put the, the lid down, the only thing that's showing through are the six individuals and they're separated by a strip of manila, if, if that makes sense to you. So I put it down in front of her. I said, take your time. Only say it if you're absolutely 1000% positive. And it didn't take her a half a second. She hit number two. She said, that's him. That's him. That son of a bitch. I can't believe he did this to me. You know, he's such a great guy. I can't believe he did it to me, et cetera. I said, are you 1000% positive? She said, I swear on my life. It's him. I saw a part of his face. I heard his voice. She said, it's him, Woody, it's him. I said, okay. And so I said, sit tight. Now go back up and everybody, the feds and everybody's in the room. And I said, look, she picked them out of the photo line up 1,000%, didn't hesitate, um, number two. And they were like, holy shit. And of course, they had already run the criminal history on a guy, not anything significant, right? And uh, they already had addresses on them, et cetera, uh, and people on standby to go what we call swamp donkey, him, which means jump out of the bushes and, and nab his ass. But the also they had uh, made up a warrant for his arrest for aggravated kidnapping based off it just just in case y'all, you know, because it. As warrants are like in the movies where people can, you know, search warrants and stuff like that. You can get them done in five minutes. It takes time. It's got to be typed up and, and worded out. Then you got to go find a judge to sign it back. Then you had to go to the judge's house. Okay. So, I mean, it was a process. You, you, they, in Livingston Parish, or the 21st Judicial, that one judge was on time, on call at all time at night. So you had to wake that judge up, and it's late now. Wake that judge up, go out there. Raise your hand, swear the oath, and, and, you know, he reads the probable cause and the warrant, and then he'll sign it or not, right? So they had already contacted the duty judge. They already had the warrant typed up and waiting to see uh, at the conclusion of the polygraph and when we showed it to her if she ID'd him. And the warrant was for aggravated kidnapping. Shit, it's serious as you can get. And But they had, in the meantime, they had SWAT guys, SRT guys, uh, stay, stay, stashed at this guy's house waiting to get him. So they they split, divide, and conquer. And they go, uh, somebody went and got the warrant signed. The rest of them go to this guy's house. They're ready to pounce. Now, they don't have to have the warrant in hand when they take him into custody. All they have to do is the other detective call him and say, hey, uh, judge just signed the warrant, get him, right? So that's what happened. The male suspect, the law enforcement officials, and there was a bunch of them. And now you're dealing with two different sheriff's offices, state police, and the feds. They go to this guy's house, and as soon as they know the warrant sign, it's game on, bitches. <laughs> and it's called drug him out, handcuffed him, drug him out. Now I'm still at the office on standby, but they, they skull drug him out, place him under arrest. He's screaming, hollering, and, and, and you know, the neighbors coming out looking and all that. And he's like, what the hell? And then you're under arrest for aggravated kidnapping. And he's like, I don't know. And they read him as Miranda rights. He's like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And then they bring him up to the office and they tell him to just don't say anything. We'll talk to you when we get to the office. And they bring him up to the office and I watch him question him. And he said, told him, he said, last night, you, you know, where were you? He said, I was at work. They said, no, you did an aggravated kidnapping, and then you participated in a bank robbery this morning. He said, I'm telling you, you feel of shit. I was at work. And, and they, said, uh, they said, would you mind taking a polygraph on it? He said, I'll take a polygraph all day long, but I'm telling you, you know, I was at work. So they sent him down to me, and I'm going to stop the story here for this week. This is about to get really stupid. But they sent him down to me, and in the, in the pretest part when I started, um, this is what I remember so vividly, and this is where it gets crazy. 
they sit him down to me. I've been watching, but then they, they bring him down to me and they introduce him. And he's a he's a young man, probably uh, out of the late twenties, clean cut. He had a little bit of uh, I mean, pissed offness is what I call it about him uh, until until he met me. And when, when they brought him in my little office and they said, "This is Detective Woody Overton. He's going to give you a polygraph." And he looked at me and he went from being cocky to he started shaking and he literally started sweat started pouring off his head and he's an African American. He was really dark skinned African American and I don't know how you describe it, uh an African male can go in pale. I thought some bitch was gonna pass out when he's looking at me. Was, his response to me is this, right? And I'm like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? And 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 um they said, Well, you know, He's going to be giving you the polygraph exam, and his eyes got wide. And, and so, sit him down, tell him who I am, and start the process. So, like I told y'all, started on her. And I'm going to tell you something. I thought he was going to pass out. I thought he was going to literally. And I, I said, "Hey, man, are you all right? You know, I'm trying to do my buddy buddy thing, figure out where I got to be." And he said, "Man, all I can tell you is." Uh, he said, I don't even know about taking this polygraph. And I said, I, mean, I said, if you don't want to take it, you don't have to take it. I mean, I said, but if you can uh, pass it, uh, I tell people before every test, if you can pass it, take it. If you if you can't pass it, don't take it with me because you're not going to cheat me and you're not going to beat me. And and um, I said, well, I can assure you, I'm a competent examiner. And if you didn't do this, then you got nothing to worry about. And he was just sitting there, y'all. He slumped down in the chair and he was sweating, and my office was cold. He's sweating buckets. He's looking ashy, and I think he's going to pass out. And I'm going to leave it right there for this week. I'm going to tell you why. But it, because the rest of it is it's about this batshit crazy. And it's, I didn't mean to go this long. Uh, but, you know, I don't use any notes. And then you Patreon members that are watching me on camera, you know I, don't, I haven't looked at anything, right? So I don't even like to do two parts, right? Uh, but this one is next week you're going to hear some the craziest shit you ever heard. And I guarantee you, I'm not going to make the million-dollar bet now because I know some of you lifers out there like to go crazy on, on Googling the, the cases uh, that I talk about. But it's crazy. Just stay tuned. It's going to be really, really crazy, and uh, it'll blow your mind. So, But that being said, I love and appreciate each and every one of y'all. Thank you. Uh, for listening. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing our, our podcast. Um, without you fans, we wouldn't have anything. And and so, uh, y'all, this is where I have to say all the podcaster shit, right, that I don't really know. Um, please continue to like us and share us. Uh, leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you go. And I don't know why iTunes, y'all, but it has something to do with the algorithms on where you're at and the charts and where we're always in the top 100, right? Uh, but the more reviews you get on iTunes, the the higher it goes. I don't know why that is because uh, I have a platform list that shows everywhere people download podcasts from, and iTunes is like way down the list, like number six or seven. So, but that's beyond my thought process. But if you can take a moment, leave us a review on iTunes, I'd appreciate it. Our Facebook pages, we have the the, the our private group, y'all, is almost at night. 18,000 or 18,800. I don't know. Our real life, real crime, friends, fans, and crew, K R E W E page. If you're not a member of it and you like real life, real crime, you got to go join it. But it's a private group. All you have to do, I mean, it's free. It, it just ask to join the group and our dream team moderators to get you approved. Dream team moderators. I love you and appreciate you. The best in the world. Yeah. We have a, People that moderate that page and almost 20,000 members, you have to, right? We have moderators from um, Canada. We have some from Australia. We have them from all over the United States. They're the best people in the world, and they do it because they love real life, real crime. So thank you all. I appreciate you. But go go check out that page. It's true crime related, and I'm on it every single day. I answer every every message that's made to me, uh, and, and, or I try to uh, in a timely manner, but I, I promise you I answer every message that's made to me. So, but it's a lot of tr- great true crime stuff on there. Uh, also, um, we have our 
course, we have a regular real life real crime pages, right? And, and that are open to the public. But then we have the real life real crime lanyard page, uh, which is where you can go post about anything you want to host watch parties, sell whatever you want to sell, et cetera. But that's also a closed group. So you get, um, you got to ask to be a member of that and like us on Instagram and our YouTube channel and all that stuff. Y'all, all that podcast, fancy stuff that, uh, you're supposed to do, check it out. And I appreciate you. Just thank you for making real life, real crime, what it is today. And again, I know it's hard times, people. It's hard times across the world. People really are dying, but it looks like maybe we might be turning a corner on this. Uh, you, you, you small business owners and you employees, the people out of work, hey, man, I get it. Y'all hang in there. And and, and I don't know what's going to happen, but I know we can get through it together. Anyway, so uh, I'll bring you to the conclusion of the story next week. Hopefully the conclusion of it because it's really detailed and involved. And it really gets crazy next week. So that's it. I'm Woody Overton, your host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. Until next time or ever, don't let me catch you down on a murder by you. Peace. Get ready. You're going to do time. Real life, real crime. Real Life Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you weekly by Woody Overton, Jim Rathman, and executive producer Toby Tomplay. How to have fun anytime, anywhere. Step one, go to ChumbaCasino.com. ChumbaCasino.com. Got it. Step two, collect your welcome bonus. Come to Papa Welcome Bonus. Step three, play hundreds of casino-style games for free. That's a lot of games. All for free? Step four, unleash your excitement. Woohoo! Chumba Casino has been delivering thrills for over a decade. So claim your free welcome bonus now and live the Chumba life. Visit ChumbaCasino.com. BGW Group, no purchase necessary. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.